great things happen when we praise God. And I'm looking forward to great things happening. And these boxes guys were going to Africa, and they were going to Niger, and we've been to Niger, all right? And what's the other place? Bikino Faso. And we've been there. So that was awesome. It's going all the way over to Africa, and it started there in Atlanta. It started with us in America, and it's going that way. And the gospel message is going with it. And that's exciting because every one box will affect a whole family. And the family's like eight to nine people. So isn't that awesome? God's got a plan. He's got a way of telling about this greatest story ever. And he used shepherds, he used a lot of people. He can use us to share the good news. He's going to use our kids this morning to share that good news. Also got uh, Roth Clayton around here. Where's Roth at? Roth's got some good news. He said he'd be real quick. All right, here we go, Roth. Pressure. Yeah. So, so we've had a year off from All-Star. And uh, if you didn't know, we are doing it again. And uh, but it's all online, and it starts, the sign-ups. But it starts in January. Uh, the registration and stuff is moved to this afternoon because I had a couple of trickle in. So, but I have to absolutely this afternoon at three o'clock, I have to cut it off because uh, I've got to make teams. Uh, the big announcement is so <clears throat> when the program started in 2007, had about 180 kids. Okay, uh, or went to All Star when I when I started with Brent. Through the years, it rose. The highest I've had is probably around 340 or so, and this year <laughs> is 430. So. <laughs> So, uh, so I need a lot of help because there's a lot of, lot of stuff going on late nights and all stuff. So anyway. Isn't that awesome? 4.30. Get your mind around that. 4.30. Man, that is awesome. And you imagine on Saturdays when we do the games in here, the testimonies, you get ready to tell a good story. But also, we need you to be a coach. You might not know how to coach volleyball. You might not know how to coach basketball. We can work with you. If you got a relationship with the Lord, that's what we need most of all. The model for these kids, a relationship with the Lord, show them how to pray. Show them how to read the Bible. Show them how to memorize scripture. That's what we want, and that's what we need, okay? God's entrusting us with 430 kids. Let's make this a great all-star season. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, one more thing. In our opening, uh, we have got our disaster crew going out. Dwight Prays in charge of that. He says he's leaving early in the morning, Todd told me. Um, Todd's a morning person like me. Uh, he's leaving early in the morning going down to Benton, Kentucky. So you'd be remembering our disaster team. And you might want to go down to Benton, Kentucky. You might want to drive down there. You might want to tell Dwight, hey, can I volunteer? Can I do something? You can. Just ask Dwight and see if you can get on that schedule of what's going on, okay? Because he knows it. He's got the disaster trailer, and we're going to go down there and minister, okay? Be praying for those people because they got hard hit by the tornado, okay? Also, Trent Wallace is around here. Trent says if we gather up water, we gather up some supplies, he'd be more than willing to take it down there as part of his work thing with Integrity Roofing. They have a ministry. They go down and help these people, so... Man, if you want to do that, please uh, let me be aware of that, and we can get that stuff delivered down there to them, okay? All right. Man, I feel like we need to go to the Lord in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm excited for today. It's good to see all your people gathered here. And Heavenly Father, it's good to have this front row packed of these kids, ready to share the good news of your story of how you came to this earth. And Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity we get to serve you. We get to see you work we get to be a part of bringing the good news of the gospel to this world. And I just pray that you help us to do it in a great way. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, one more thing on getting ready for Christmas. We've got our candle over here. This is called Advent. We're preparing our hearts for Christmas, but we're preparing for the second coming of Jesus. It's going to happen, okay? They're getting closer now than what we were last week, okay? But it's going to be happening, and we need to be prepared, our hearts for that. So we need to accept Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And as we prepare for Christmas, this pink candle represents somebody special. Anybody know? Yes, right up front row. Jesus, nope. Give me another guess. Is there a lady in our Christmas story today? A mom? What was her name? Mary. Mary, yeah, this candle represents Mary. Mary had a vital part to play in the birth of Jesus, okay? 
She was 14 years old, guys. She was uh, not from a big wealthy family, but she was told by the angel that she was going to have a son. And they were going to call his name Messiah, Jesus, Emmanuel. And she had to be in tune with what the Spirit was doing in her. And she had to trust. You know, God calls us to walk by trust, too. It's called our faith. We don't always know the outcome. We don't always know everything that we have to do. But we walk by faith in serving him every day. Mary's a great example of that. Mary was only 14 years old. I work with teenagers all the time. Teenagers, man, they could be one way, this way. And it's a teenager, okay? I want you to remember that when you look at Mary. She was a teenager. But God used her in a mighty way because she was grounded in what God was doing in that situation. Yes, they said bad things about Mary. God didn't take that away. They still made fun of Mary. Hey, do you know this world makes fun of us Christians? But we need to wear that as a badge of honor. He said that we will be persecuted for believing in him. And we will. But we need to proclaim it loudly. Even though this world doesn't understand, we need to understand. But we walk by faith. And it's not always by sight. Okay? We walk by faith. And that he can do great things to us. So we're going to light the merry candle today. And as our kids get ready to go, we're going to watch this video right up here of uh, Lottie Moon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. For giving. For giving. Thank you for your giving. To the Lottie Moon offering. Toward Lottie Moon. Thank you for giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. But most importantly, due to your generosity, we've been able to share God's word with those around us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Because you gave, I'm able to access remote areas of Central Asia and explain the gospel with people God is already drawing to himself. With your help, we are bringing light the dark places among unreached people groups. Because of what you've given, it allows me to share this gospel with as many Central Asians as I can across London. Your giving allows our organization to provide need for refugees and to give them hope. Thank you for giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering so that we can buy Bibles in Arabic that we use with our Discovery Bible Study with non-believers. Because of your generosity, African women are hearing stories from God's word while henna is being drawn on their hands and arms. And because of your giving, the life changes that we see through faith in Jesus Christ, that happens because of your gifts. Thank you for giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and helping to provide this wonderful water filter here in Northern Thailand. Your giving allows me to continue with my medical license here in Ghana, where I can not only do surgeries, but also the patients have the opportunity to hear the gospel. So thank you. Because of your giving, I'm able to speak to these thousand kids every Wednesday morning. Thank you. Thank you, First Baptist Church. Thank you, Faith Baptist Church. Thank you, Christina Baptist Church. Thank you for giving to Lati Moon. Thank you, and God bless you. There's a song that goes along with that by Ray Boat that you can pull it up. Speak to that really, really good. Just me today. Mom's home with our great grandbabies. Brother Dwayne said something about four weeks ago, I think it was, that I thought would make a really, really good thing for us at DBC. He said something about getting to. Jeff and Sherry Easter had an old song about four years ago. I don't have to go to church. I get to. We don't have to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We get to don't we? We don't have to come here to church. We get to. And I'm going to share with you about some of what you just saw there. About 35, 40 years ago, where Mom and I were at at North Alton, Southern Baptist Church in Alton, we had one of our foreign missionaries from across the pond, and big, tall, lanky fellow. And he was one of those areas where if you were found to be a professing Christian, you got arrested, handcuffed, Take it to the square, decapitated, 
And that was the end of it. And he said the only way they could uh, get the ministry out and meet, they'd have a volunteer to stand on the street and pass that information out, a name and an address. They couldn't get there with their bicycles, their little motor scooters or however they come. They had to get there with their legs because if they seen a big congregation, they'd come in, arrest them, and they would be gone. And someone asked me, he said, uh, you probably have a hard time getting a volunteer to stand on that street corner and pass that information out. He said, no, not at all. He said, I got a list as long as my arm. Full of names, ready to stand on that street corner and pass that information out. What's your cost going to call to you today for the Light of Moon Christmas offering to keep that going? We need those missionaries wherever they're at, and our Lottie Moon Christmas offering helps does that. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to stand here in a facility where we can worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the way we see fit. And Father, we do want to lift you those of the tornado victims. Just wrap your loving arms around each family, Father. Be there with them. Because we know we need you. And Father, as we take up our offering, your, that our Lord and Moon Christmas offering, that we will reach our goal, that we will help spread the word wherever it needs to go. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you much. As Kayla gets these kids ready to roll, I want to set them up. I don't want to do that announcement. As she gets them ready to go, this Wednesday night, we are taking our kids caroling. And I don't know if you know it, but this is a kind of crazy season. I won't let you in the nursing home, that type of thing. I'm needing a list of people inside Harrisburg. I might not get to them all, but I need a good list of people that would appreciate some kids showing up in their front yard singing some carols. Because I think that's a great thing to do this Christmas season, to proclaim his birth. And we're going to be doing that this Wednesday night. We're going to start at 5 o'clock. We'll get done a little after 6, but we'll take the bus and we'll go as many places as we can. So, uh, man, this Christmas choir is getting ready to happen, and Kayla's getting them ready. Kayla, are you ready? Good morning. Um, while they are getting set up, I'm going to go ahead and start us with a prayer. Dear God, thank you so much. Thank you for an opportunity to gather, and uh, thank you for an opportunity um, to let the kids come and share your story. I want to thank you for each of them. I pray peace. I pray blessings. I pray health over all of them and all of their families. God, I am so, so overwhelmed by, by just how good you are and how willing you are to come and, and be with us in this place, God. I'm thankful for, for a church that is so compassionate toward missions, that, that is willing to, to come and let, let anyone serve, um, no matter their age um, or anything, God. I just thank you, and I pray that, that this helps someone. In your name, amen. So, this is, um, we weren't able to do it last year, and so I am so grateful that we are able to do the Christmas program this year. Um, I have only seen these kids four times before, um, before they were up here on this stage. So I would just like you to give them a round of applause because they have worked hard. <laughs> I am so thankful for all of them and for their families and, um, and just how much, um, how much this church is, is willing to do and, um, and work to make sure that our kids go out knowing the gospel and knowing that message. Um, today, I just want you to know that, yes, Mary was 14, 
right? She was 14. She was an unwed mother, okay? I'm sure we all know somebody. I was that person. I wasn't 14, but I was an unwed mother. Now, God, God sent his son, and he could have sent him to a king. He could have sent him to somebody in parliament. He could have sent him to be in the president's family. But he chose to come and be with us in our mess. That is what he chose. Because within our mess is our message. And so I just want you guys to think about whatever has been hard in this past two years. Um, if you have grief, if you have loss, if you have sadness, if you have embarrassment, if you have anger, if you have mess, which we all do, just know that God wants to be with you in that mess. Thank you.
Let's pray together as we prepare for offering. God, we thank you, Father, for that unspeakable gift. In the name we see even now, Jesus, come for us, born of a virgin. We're so grateful, Lord, that that part of the story we get to celebrate today and that you may use it and what we're going to see in it today to draw our hearts and our minds and our affections as we worship you through the Christmas season. We worship you in song. We worship you in giving, Lord. Now we worship you in hearing and responding to the word of God. We give you thanks for everything you have in mind today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's sing together.
heaven come now let your glory reign shining like the day king of heaven
Well, good morning again. <laughs> uh, it's been an interesting and very full morning. How about the kids? Let's thank the kids one more time for talking us through and proclaiming the Christmas story and some of the things that you heard in the narration we're going to hear from Scripture again this morning. One of the things that you hear regularly hear from this pulpit is that God is sovereign and works all things out for his glory and for our good. And for whatever reason today, that means Dwayne is homesick and I'm standing here. By the way, I think, I think it means he's being treated for flu at this point. So another round of something different for Dwayne. So pray for him as he, as he is going to be on the recovery in the next few days. That being said, all of that being said, I do always particularly cherish and treasure the opportunity to do this, to share God's word this morning. I hope it's encouraging for you as well, as short notice as it may be. Hopefully it will be a blessing and something to you that will uh, hopefully be coherent and make sense. <laughs> um, every year after Thanksgiving at our house, we start with the Christmas movies. After Thanksgiving. That's the law, by the way. After Thanksgiving, we start with the Christmas movies and the Christmas music, and we put them on a loop, right? We watch some of them several, several times. There's one we watch probably at least two dozen times between Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. And then, of course, there are the songs and the music, which I still and will not negotiate. They should not be played in public until after Thanksgiving, but that's not why we're here. <laughs> there are all kinds of things that we typically do, sing, watch, even eat, really only this time of year. And one of the things that pops up, at least in my circles, is Christmas Bible story trivia. Uh, and uh, so here's a couple of examples. How many wise men came to see Jesus on the night he was born? Actually, I saw a really good answer over here. I won't say I'll say because it's kind of a trick question. And I heard but good answer. It's a trick question for two reasons. One is we don't know, right? We don't know because the text never actually says. We have the song, We Three Kings, so everybody immediately says three, and all the nativities have three, and all the movies have three, so it's three, right? No, we actually don't know that. And two, they weren't there the night Jesus was born, because we know most scholars, almost every scholar agrees, they came sometime later, some estimate up to two years later. How about this one? What did the angels sing to the shepherds that night? It's a trick question. They didn't sing. Not strictly according to the biblical text. We'll get to that in in just a moment, but we know that they praised God with their words, saying. That's what the text says. And I, that one gets people to say, no, wait, what? No. They, and, and they have to go you know, read for themselves. You can go read it. We're going to read it in just a few minutes. Maybe they sang, maybe not. But we know that they proclaimed and they sang. So that's kind of a trick question as well. What, what about this one? One more. What animals were present when, when, it, when and where Jesus was born? We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> that's another kind of a trick question. Now, it's a reasonable assumption, right, uh, because we know where they were, but we don't really know the answer to that question because none of them are mentioned in Scripture. All of our nativity scenes are just assumptions. They're reasonable assumptions, but they're assumptions nonetheless. There's probably a lot of things that we have in our collective picture of Christmas night. The classic nativity scene is what we all picture, right? The shepherds, the wise men, the angels... All present, uh, cattle, sheep, maybe a camel, Mary and Joseph, uh, all put together looking lovingly and very sweetly down at a very clean and very well-behaved baby Jesus, right? And the trivia, as fun as it is, is kind of a, it's in a funny way, it reminds us that we should, for truth and for fact about Scripture, rely on Scripture, right? Uh, so, so that's what we do, and so that's kind of a funny way to do that, but one thing this makes me wonder at times, as, as, the, as the trivia questions, the stumpers, whatever, however you want to call them, they give us some realizations about what was really part of those chains of events and what maybe not was not part of those chains of events regarding the birth of Christ that we're certain of from the Bible and what are traditions, what are assumptions, reasonable though they may be, of the story. What makes me wonder is, what I wonder were some of the realizations as that played out of the people who were different players in the drama. We've had a little program this morning, we'll put it in that phrase. Different players in, the, different characters in the story, as it were. What might they have come to grips with about God through their part in the play? And perhaps more importantly, is there something that each of those can teach us? 
And so we're going to read through the biblical narrative. We've already heard it this morning through the, through the narration and the Christmas and the kids program. We're going to read together. We're going to read from Luke 2 and Matthew 2. We did this each year when the kids were a lot younger. We read it at our house every Christmas Eve. We will read it at Christmas Eve here at our Christmas Eve service here at Dorisville. But as we read them today, we're going to take again a brief look at some of the characters in the narrative with an eye to what they can teach us. So let's start in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that same region were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, uh Glory to God in the highest and peace and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And with the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. And at the end of eight days when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given him by the angel before before he was conceived in the womb. Now we turn to Matthew chapter 2 and read the the rest of the story, as it were. Chapter 2 in Matthew begins, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold... The star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child Mary with his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray. God, thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for everything it reveals us and, to the, and the one to whom it points us, our Savior, King Jesus. And as we read the story of your birth today, Lord Jesus, and we uh, look at the different people who are around those events, may by your spirit you teach us some things that you would have us to know and be reminded of. We give it to you, Lord, and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. These are well-known parts of the story to this group, right? We know the story. We read them several times every, every Christmas season. And we read them, as best I understand, in what we would consider chronological order of events. Most of us, I would assume, we all probably know this story very well. And every time I read them, nowadays especially, it's particularly and more so in the last few years, I am recaptured 
recaptured, yeah, that's a good word, recaptured by the wonder of it. We're very familiar with it. So we kind of just read it sometimes mechanically, right? But it's, it's amazing. This story is amazing. This story is impossible, yet we believe we know in this room, we know that it's true. Amen. So I'm recaptured by the wonder of it more and more every year. Jesus and the events surrounding his birth fulfilled so much specific prophecy in detail that when we know that, we cannot seriously doubt his identity as God incarnate, come to save his people from their sins. We know this. We know that indeed Christ is the promise fulfilled. That would be the title today if we were given the message of title. That's what it would be today, promise fulfilled. There is so much in this story that we too often just read out of habit this time of year to unpack, to revisit, to study, to learn from. Even the two words of the title, promise fulfilled, encapsulate so much of what this story means in this moment of the gospel story. Jesus has come, God incarnate, God in the flesh, born of a virgin, to live sinlessly, to die a brutal sacrificial death in our place, taking upon himself the full weight of the wrath of a just God on our behalf, rising from the dead to validate his victory and demonstrate his victory and validate his sacrifice. This is what had been promised, and this is what has been given. What I want to do for the next few moments today is to, again, look at some of the players in the drama, as it were, and look for one, maybe two things we can learn from each, uh, each of them and from their part in the story. Let's start with Mary. Now, we're going to go to a couple of places outside of the text that we just read. These will not be on the, on the screen, I don't think. Uh, we're going to go to Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at Mary. In uh, Luke chapter 1, in verse 26, begins this way, in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I'm a virgin? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed her. So with Mary, we learn, we see what I'm going to call today in this moment God's gentle sovereignty, his gentle sovereignty. Now, again, you will hear me, and some of you have for a long time, heard me loudly, consistently proclaim the sovereignty of God. He is creator, he is king, he is Lord. He can and does do as he wills, when he wills, how he wills. He's God, we're not. Amen. With Mary in this moment... He was very particularly clear about his, uh, his intent, his will, for her. But he was also, I, th I think, very gentle in how he exercised his authority in the moment and how he brought Mary's attention to it and her part in it. And in that moment, Mary had a what I think is a very reasonable question and a little bit surprising to me when I think, when I realize what I think is true, that it came not from a place of doubt, but from of faith. When she was told about something about to happen involving her that she knew was not possible, she did not say no. She did, she did not say that can't be. She asked How is this going to work? 
I don't think it was a question of, of denial. She was wondering, I, I hear what you're saying. I know who you're from. I just, I don't, how does it, how does it work? Think about it this way. I believe Mary already had faith in the God of Israel, the God that she knew. But here, Mary came to understand through this very moment of very special, powerful, clear, yet gentle revelation of God's sovereign will and her part in it, of God's ability to work around even the natural order of things to accomplish what he says and to fulfill his purposes. So what did God do? He answered her question. Clearly, simply, gently. She was confronted both with God's Sovereign involvement in her life and the way he gently brought her in. For the record, he can and still does that. So from Mary, God's gentle sovereignty. From Joseph, we can see two things, I think. Uh, let's go and we're going to go back to Matthew 1. We're going to look at part of Joseph's story. And we're going to see two things. We're going to see, I think, that we see an example and we can learn about God's grace and God's protection. First of all, God's grace. Matthew 1, uh, starting in verse 18. Now the birth of Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph... Son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took his wife. But he knew her not until she had given birth to the son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph, being a respectable, in the culture, particularly in that culture, a respectable but caring man, had decided to separate from Mary, which he had every right to do, but to do so in a way that brought no additional unnecessary shame on her. Frankly, that's, I think, beyond honorable, considering the culture and the moment they were in, and that according to the letter of the law, he could have had her stoned in this moment. Yet he showed grace. But take note of why he showed grace. God came to him and spoke again to him very clearly. God gave him a very clear moment of grace and revelation here. He showed grace because he was shown grace. And here it was in the form of an angel of the Lord speaking clearly to him in a dream and answering all the questions and concerns and reservations that he had in his mind. When it comes down to it, God spoke, Joseph heard, and Joseph obeyed. When one is shown grace, we tend to be better at giving grace. And Joseph experienced God's grace here in a very particular way. And therefore he showed it in a very particular way. Also for Joseph, I think we see his protection. Over in chapter 2, we see another part of the story, uh, and another angel shows up in verse 13. When they had departed, behold, uh, when the wise men, this is right after the wise men in the, in the text, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had said, spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. And skip to verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord again appeared in a dream to Joseph, saying, Rise, take this child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. In this text, again, Joseph is instructed to flee with his young family to protect them from Herod's murderous insanity, which, by the way, it's very logical and most people believe that the whole trip was made forward by the gifts the wise men, Magi, had just brought him. That's another way God's, it's, it, 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 it's another way that God's sovereignty and involvement in the details of life are so clear. 
God lays these things at their feet and then says, go to Egypt, where a few minutes ago they might not have been able to go to Egypt. So God taught Joseph a very important lesson in this moment. That is this. God always has our best interest at heart. No matter how difficult the path may seem to get there. And it could also be added, whether we think what's in our best interest is agrees with what he thinks has been our best interest. God always has his people's best interest at heart, and he guards them. So from Mary, we see God's gentle sovereignty. From Joseph, God's grace and God's protection. And back to the main narrative of the story, let's look at the shepherds. From the shepherds, and this one is probably a little bit more obvious when I, when I say it. From the shepherds, we see an experience of God's glory, God's Obvious, displayed, enormous glory, and we see its demand for a response. They witnessed something extraordinary, to use a gross understatement. <laughs> extraordinary. If they had not seen it, they would not have believed it. I imagine the first other shepherds or people they knew when they came back into town and tell them what they said, they said, you guys have, you guys have been drinking or something. There's no way that happened. But they witnessed it. They saw it. And once they had witnessed it, they knew they had to talk about it, act on it. They knew they had just been given this fantastic, undeniable, glorious revelation about the Christ who had come. And they could not keep it as their own. They could not not act on it, respond to it. When God reveals himself to you, no matter what part of your faith journey you're on, when he reveals himself to you, when he opens your heart in the beginning to realize the truth of the gospel, the saving, keeping, restoring, healing, convicting gospel, the greatest revelation of all, that he came to die for one like you and for me, and he did, that's what we're reading about this morning, when, when we are overwhelmed by difficult moments and in those moments, we're more overwhelmed by his comfort and gentleness. When we, when we fall into... No, I'm not going to use that phrase. When we choose to go off into sin, and he, as we know, he is pursuing us with his relentless love by the Holy Spirit, to the point we maybe don't even want to come to church because it makes us squirm in our seat, we know why. We know God is working in our heart that understanding of the gospel in that moment. The greatest revelation of all. And we know it demands a response. That response is to, again, to trust in Christ, to repent of your sin, to give him your life. When God reveals himself, even though he might not reveal himself to us like he did that night to them, when he reveals himself, we must Respond, as did the shepherds. What about the wise men? We see them in Matthew chapter 2. We've already read their part of the story. Through the wise men, I think we see what I'm going to call God's sovereignty over nature, but also his sovereignty over his people, over our hearts. These guys, whatever they were, and there's a lot of debate over what they actually were. Were they kings? Were they sages? Were they mystics? Were they uh, astrologers, astronomers? You know, there's a lot of debate as to what, they, what, they, what their function, what their office was. But whatever they were, they clearly knew enough about the heavens, the stars, and the natural order of things to know that this thing they were observing was what we will call an abnormal astrological event. <laughs> they knew that. They apparently also knew enough about the one true God of Israel and his scriptures and the prophecies to know that this event had to do with him. In other words, because of what they knew and what God had revealed to them, they had a run-on encounter with the God they had read about exercising full rule over nature itself and the fact that he can do whatever he wants to with it whenever he wants to for his own good ends, purpose, and pleasure. They were also faced with the truth that this same God was sovereign over their hearts and drawing them because they knew they had to go worship him. They had to go find him and worship him. That's the same thing God is doing in here this morning. 
He's, he's brought us together to sing songs of the Lord, to turn to him in prayer, to hear the word and come together and worship the same risen king that they were worshiping in the manger. Each of the players in the story, I think, and I would say these are very small summaries. There's probably a lot more we could unpack, but they each have something to teach us. However, I would like to go to one other person in the larger story of the birth of Jesus. Uh, it's maybe outside the, the passages we would typically read. And that person is Simeon. Probably my favorite single person in the, in the whole story of the birth and young Jesus. And I look to him in particular because of what we what I put as the title of this of the message, which is the promise fulfilled. In Luke chapter two, beginning in verse twenty-five, now this is um, after Jesus has been born, after eight days he's circumcised, and then there's more requirements of the law that they're in the temple. And in the temple, in verse twenty-five, we read, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. <clears throat> and he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for your glory, for glory to your people, Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Simeon plays a unique role in the story of the birth of Christ, of birth of Jesus, that confirms again Jesus as the fulfillment of all the prophecy and all the promise that had been given to Israel about the Messiah. You see, Simeon, who knew the prophecies well, had been promised he would see, physically see, the salvation of the Lord personally. He saw God's salvation. First, he saw and had been seen, had seen for some time, he'd seen the promise of salvation. In verses 25 and 26, we see this. Simon had been given a very real, a very personal, and very particular, and one might say very peculiar promise, in addition to all the prophecies that he knew so well. He had been told by the Holy Spirit that he literally would not die until his physical eyes saw what the text calls the consolation of Israel, which he knew would be the Messiah. Simon knew that God would keep his promise. He trusted God and his word. Simeon trusted God and his word. And so should we. The promise of salvation. And then he saw what he knew in this moment for him, and by extension, because it's recorded in the text for us, was the proof of salvation. Verse 27 to 30. This, these verses are particularly special to me. It's one of my favorite moments in like music drama stuff over the years. Years ago, like a long, long time ago, like 20, like 20 oh my goodness, 20, over 20 years ago. There was a moment in a play that we did where we had, we, this was part of our Christmas production we were doing, and the baby that we had, I said in the first service it was David, my wife corrected me, it wasn't David, um, but the, the baby, you know, babies are fussy and you never know what baby Jesus is going to do when he's in the middle of a live play, and the guy we had who was playing Simeon, they brought in and he was doing incense and we made it look like a temple, it was a pretty cool moment, and he comes in. And he takes the baby from Mary and Joseph and he holds him up. It says, it says right here, he took him up in his arms. He held him up like this. And the baby and him just locked eyes. And for 90 seconds or more, they froze. And this baby never moved. And Butch, the guy's name was Butch, was just, I thought he was going to drop the baby. He was weeping 
on just weeping openly. So this moment for, you know, for that reason has a particular place in, in my own life. I, I love this moment, but the moment, I, this, look at what happens here. The moment that he saw the baby Jesus, quickened by the Spirit of God, he knew. And by the Spirit was recorded in the text, so we would know that this child was the fulfillment of God's promise to him and to Israel and to us. He had been given the promise of salvation. He sees the proof of salvation. But there's another one that I don't think he expected or maybe even, I don't know if he realized. And I'm going to call it the provision of salvation. Simon, I think, I'm just on the word think, spoke prophetically one thing here that I'm not sure he maybe knew beforehand. And that was in verses 29 to 32. He prophetically spoke that this child, who was the fulfillment of all the prophecy and all the promises, would be the same not only for Israel, but for the entire world and all who would come to him in faith. We should be especially grateful for that in this room this morning because none of us are Hebrews. For us today, we are included. And we know that Simeon had that revelation and shared it with them and by extension with us. We who are in Christ are included in the promise. For us today, we see in Christ hopefully all of these things. Most importantly today, what I want you to see is the story that we're so familiar with. What I want you to see is salvation. The redemption of God's people is found only in one place and only in one person. And that's Jesus Christ. And we've seen it today. You've been given again today, see through the story of Simeon in particular, the promise, the proof, and the provision of that salvation. And they are all three, Jesus Christ. So what, what do we do with this story, with this moment, with these revelations? I think it's very simple. Our response should be the same as Mary and Joseph when the angels spoke to them. Our response should be the same as the shepherds when the angels lit up the night sky. Our response should be the same as the magi when, uh, when they witnessed and followed the star and found the Messiah they saw. Simply, yes, Lord. Perhaps you're here today and you've never really, you know, you just have never really fully, completely trusted in Christ for your salvation. I would encourage you to do it today. Repent of sin. Place your faith in the Messiah who has come and his finished work at the cross. Repent and believe. Perhaps you know him, but we're not trusting him as fully as we should. We're not fully following him as closely as we might. Same word. Turn from that. Repent from that sin and get what we would call back on track. Whatever the response is, whatever yes, Lord, you need to say, I would encourage you, do it today. We're going to sing. Brent's going to be down front. The altar will be open, as always. I'll be around after service if you'd like to speak to me. Some of our deacons will be around. But as we continue our celebration of Christmas this week, perhaps, perhaps you have some more specific things to think about and contemplate with what we've learned from the characters in the story this morning. Or maybe even you have some more details you can share with someone that you know needs to hear. So let us pray and, and we're going to sing. God, thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for... <laughs> thank you for Jesus. Come for us. Come for your people. Thank you for the way you came demonstrating, proving, literally in hundreds of ways that Jesus was exactly who the scripture says and he claims to be. Thank you for, through, this, through, the, through the different people in the narrative that we see in the text today, strengthening our faith and hopefully strengthening and enhancing our worship as we go through the Christmas season. 
So we know you have come, Lord Jesus, to earth. We ask you again to come now, work in our hearts. Draw us as we worship you. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing together to Jesus. lift up our pastor today and we need to lift up the winners family we need to lift up the victims of Kentucky and the tornadoes and man remember to shine your light remember to share the story As those shepherds went out they said hey we have seen something great we've seen something prophesied for so many years ago and it's happened today in Bethlehem hey it's happening right now. He came to save us all. Hmm. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Tell me, Father, we just thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you that one day this whole world's going to proclaim your name and know that you are the Savior of this world. Hmm. And tell me, Father, man, I just pray that we get things right. We get that relationship right. And tell me, Father, we'd be ready for your second coming. Help us to proclaim your name. Help us to proclaim your Christmas story. Help our light to shine everywhere we go. 
And Heavenly Father, you've caused a lot of tough things to happen in our world. A lot of tough things of people we love passing on. Heavenly Father, of disasters. But you gave us a message of hope. You gave us a message to proclaim to this world that's broken. That you are the Savior of this world. I just pray that we proclaim it loudly. Be it our Operation Christmas Child boxes, be it the many ways that this gospel goes out. And thank you for our kids this morning leading us out. Thank you for Brother Dave's message that came from your word. I just pray that you leave and go with us today. Help us to shine. In Jesus' name I pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen.